Well, I'll start by uh, telling folks, hey, the whole reason we're doing this webcast is to benefit the Robert Davis Memorial Foundation or Memorial Fund. So if you go to that URL on the slide, it's you can leave donations. Our suggested donation is $25 for uh, Robert Davis's fund. Robert Davis is a Microsoft certified master who passed away suddenly earlier this year. And he was always giving back to the community, always doing all kinds of free stuff on SQL help, on his blog, MS SQL tips all over the place, answering questions at Stack Exchange. He just loved giving back to the community. So what we're asking is if you can give back some to his fund to help his family through their time of need, that would be incredible. Just $25. If everyone on here donated $25, it would make a huge difference in his family's well-being. So when you can, you don't have to do it now, but either after the webcast, when you go to download the slides, go down to brenozar.com slash go slash DeWitt, and there's a link on there to their GoFundMe page. You can check that out, plus download the slides from uh, today's session. So having said all that, I'll, we'll hand it over to a person who's much smarter than me and needs no introduction amongst this uh, SQL Server crowd. Uh, doctor, take it away, sir. Uh, thank you, and, and welcome uh, to all 246 people that are still listening. Uh, you know, it's actually an interesting technology, which I've never used before. Uh, you know, at SQL Pass, I gave a number of talks, and they were really the highlight of my some of my years at Microsoft. Um, and there it's harder to walk out of a talk because especially if you're in the front row. Um, uh, but here it's easy to walk out of a talk, and I hope you stay with me, and I hope you make a donation. So this is a reprise uh, of a talk I gave at SQL Pass, I think in 2010. And uh, I remember two things about this talk. One, it was incredibly hard to distill the theory into an hour, hour and 15 minute presentation. And number two, my wife was sitting in back with Quentin Clark, who was then the GM of SQL. Um, and it was the first time, one of the few times in my life, my wife has actually heard me talk. And she leaves to Quentin at some point during the talk and says, I think there's a math error on that slide. Now, my wife is not a math person. And for her to catch a math error, the bad thing is in preparing this talk, um, I was going through the slides and I still can't find the math error. So I, I, I'll leave it for someone else to try to find it. So the title of this talk is SQL Query Optimization. Why is it so hard to get right? Um, whoops. Uh oh. Oh, click on the. No, you're good. Click on the PowerPoint and then it'll start advancing again. This is what happens when you click on uh, something else outside of GoToWebinar. Okay, good. So here's, a, here's an interesting picture, and I used this in the talk before. Who painted this picture? And it's actually a picture of the SQL Server Query Optimizer running for, t for SQL 2008, uh, running TPCH Query 8, which has a bunch of joins. And I'll talk about this at the end. Um, this is actually a pretty discouraging picture because in this query where two of the uh, parameters selection predicates uh, are varied, SQL Server will generate 256 plans. So very small differences in parameter values uh, produces a different plan. Now you can see plan one is pretty stable over a whole range of parameter values as is plan two, three, and four. But down in the left-hand corner, there are a large number of colors. We'll come back to that. Um, so today um, I'm gonna talk about SQL query optimization. I'm gonna start with the fundamentals. So this is material that I originally prepared for graduate classes when I was a professor. Um, and, you know, it's intended to be a general talk about query optimization and not a specific talk about how to fix the query plans that SQL does a bad job of generating some, sometimes. And, and then I'm gonna come at the end and talk about something that I, I didn't get to finish uh, before I left Microsoft. And that is the ability of really changing the game as database systems move to the cloud. And I'll come back and talk about that a little bit at the end. So I think this quote is really true. Um, <laughs> uh, query optimization is harder than rocket science. Um, um, and it's really, really challenging. Uh, it, it's the most challenging component to build in a database system. Um, it's really easy to get it wrong. Um, it's really easy to have regressions. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's one of the areas of technology that really hasn't progressed much um, over the years. 
So here's the, the general rule, role of the query optimizer. Uh, I think all of you understand this pretty well. A SQL statement comes in, gets fed through parser, uh, through the query optimizer, and then out comes a query plan. Mm -hmm. So here's TPCH, you know, which is involves, um, you know, a select with an in, embedded select uh, over these uh, six tables, part supplier, line item, orders, customer, nation, um, and two copies of nation and region. And it's got a bunch of joins between these tables. Um, there, are, it, I actually went and calculated to some degree of, uh, of accuracy, probably not very high. Uh, there are about 22 million ways of executing the query. So the goal of the query optimizer is to, um, to search through this huge space of alternative query plans and pick one that's going to execute the query as quickly as possible. Uh, probably rarely do you get the optimal plan, but the goal is to get a very good plan in a short period of time. Um, now, maybe if we all had quantum computers, we could explore this entire space, and maybe long after I'm in the grave, people will actually build the query optimizer that takes advantage of a quantum computer. But the goal is there are a large number of plans, and, that, and that's not a particularly difficult query. Um, and uh, there are a large number of plans, and you got to pick up the query optimizer has to pick a plan quickly. So it's interesting. Um, my my first technical paper in the database field um, was presented in the same technical session of the annual SIGMOD conference, which is an academic database conference, um, as Pat Selinger. Nobody has ever referenced my paper. Um, her paper <laughs> uh, basically introduced the whole idea of cost-based query optimization um, and uh, as part of the IBM System R project. For those of you that are a little younger, at the very beginning, there was System R, which is a project at IBM, uh, later became DB2, and Mike Stonebreaker's Ingress project, which was done at Berkeley. And these two were the very first relational database systems that were built. And Oracle came a little long, along a little later, um, uh, as did obviously SQL Server. So I really believe this is true. It's the hardest part of building a database system. I think every place else, uh, the algorithms are pretty well known. Um, and progress is really limited uh, by the fear of regressions. So whenever I was part of the SQL team, picking, you know, making a major change to the query optimizer was, was viewed with great trepidation. It's also really complicated by a, a couple things, um, advances in hardware and the rest of the, of the database software. So if you think about it, hardware, we go back to the 70s, late 70s, hardware is at least a thousand times bigger and faster. The software itself is faster because we've developed algorithms to take advantage of the hardware. And it's possible because storage is so cheap to query, to, to store it in your relational database system and query just huge amounts of, of data. So you have this rapidly changing um, uh, hardware. Uh, you have this software which keeps improving. You have vast amounts of data. So the, 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 the point I'm trying to make here is that a, mis a mistake on a 100 megabyte table uh, may have, mm -hmm. in terms of picking the best plan, it's likely to have uh, much lower consequences than a mistake over a table that's two terabytes or 10 terabytes or a petabyte. And one of the things I do in my time now is I uh, do a little consulting for Facebook um, and their people, it really are their petabyte tables that they operate mm -hmm. uh, their warehouses over. Um, mm -hmm. And they do that actually without query optimizer sometime, which is another interesting point. Um, not part, the point of this talk. Um, okay, so here's the, the, the goal. The query comes in, it gets parsed, gets put into a logical operator tree. It runs through the cost-based query optimizer to pick a physical operator tree, and then it gets passed to the query execution. So the logical operator tree, and we'll see this repeatedly, it, it's the tree that after you parse the SQL, you turn it into this operator tree. It, that operator tree is decorated with operators like selections and joins and group buys. 
And it's important to keep in mind that the logical operator tree is not the physical operator tree. So the physical operator tree is for each of the logical operators, pick an algorithm to execute it. So for, in the case of a selection on a table, for example, we can scan the entire table or we can use an index on a predicate. In the case of a join logical operator, if I'm combining two tables, I can use sort merge join, hash join, nested loops join, uh, index nested loops join. So for every logical operator, there are frequently multiple physical, op physical operators or physical implementations of that logical operator. And we'll, we'll talk about this. So let's start with a really the world's simplest query. We have a table called reviews, and I'm going to compute the average rating of all these movies. Uh, the table has, as you see in the upper right hand corner of this slide, um, date, um, customer ID, movie ID, and rating. Um, and as Brent said at the beginning, if those of you that missed it, these slides are available on Brent's website. Um, and you're welcome to send, send me uh, questions by email uh, later on. And um, Brent will get you my email address. I forgot to put it on my slides. Right. Um, as I said, I'm retired, so I have lots of time to answer email. Okay. <laughs> uh, so here we, here we have the, the SQL statement. Um, hopefully it's syntactically correct. <laughs> Goes through the parser and out comes a operator tree. So at the bottom, we have a table called reviews. We, on top of that, we have a selection, which is find the row, find the reviews from movie 932, and then take those and compute an average um, uh, rating for that movie. Now, there are two uh, possible ways we might execute this query. So, so on the left, the green, we've seen every, we've seen the logical tree. On the right, we see two physical uh, trees. Query plan one takes the reviews, just looks at every single review, applies the filter, and then computes the average um, by computing a count and running sum. So that's typically how averages are computed. You take the rows, you, you count how many rows you've seen, you produce, take a running sum, uh, and then at the end, you do the division to get the average. Uh, an alternative is to take and use an index on the reviews table on movie ID, and take movie ID 932 and pull from the reviews table all the re all the reviews for that particular movie, and then feed those rows into the average aggregate computation. So we scan this quick review. What I said, scan by the entire table. We the number of disk IOs will be equal to the number of reviews, and the IOs will be sequential. So I'm going to look at the first page of reviews, and the second page of reviews, and the third page of reviews. The filter is applied to all the rows, um, and only rows that satisfy the predicate get passed on to the average. The second one um, is uh, we, we use as the index. We'll just retrieve the rows with movie ID equal 932. Um, and since we'll say, assume that the index is not clustered on movie ID, i.e. the sort order is different, every single row we pick out using the index will involve a seek. Um, and you know these numbers depend very much like is it on a moving head disk is it on an enterprise moving head disk or or a sata low cost moving head disk is it on flash um, so this is one of the challenges the optimizer builder has is um, the query optimizer has to has to calculate the cost and the cost is typically in execution time um, but the optimizer builder has no clue about what your IO subsystem looks like. How big is your memory? And it tries to incorporate that to some extent, but not the extent to which um, would be possible. And certainly not the extent to which it's gonna uh, be known in the cloud. And then we do the same thing. So which plan, which plan is cheaper? Well, the optimizer must estimate the cost of both plans. And we're gonna dive into during this presentation, how the optimizer goes about es estimating the cost. The first thing you need, and we're going to again go into this and talk about how it's done in practice, we need to estimate the selectivity of the predicate of MID equal 932. And then we need to calculate the cost in terms of CPU time and IO time. And it's weird because you, the optimizer has to add together 
uh, these two units, uh, uh, which are, you know, they're both in seconds or milliseconds in terms of time, but they're really sort of, uh, it's sort of apples and oranges that you're adding together. Now, the, to get the selectivity, so the selectivity is basically how many rows. To get the selectivity, the query optimizer uses statistics about each table to make these estimates. Okay, so, and we're gonna talk about histograms and statistics in a second. And it turns out that the best plan will depend exactly on how many reviews there are for this particular movie. Now, notice not all movies are equally popular. So <laughs> some movies may only have very few reviews. Um, and for those movies, maybe using the index is the better plan. But for a super popular, you know, blockbuster movie with millions and millions of uh, visits and reviews, maybe the sequential scan will be better. So this is the kind of thing, this, this non-uniformity in data um, really can uh, hurt the ability of a database system to estimate selectivity. And we'll see how histograms get around that problem. So here's the $64 question. How many reviews from the movie will there be? Okay, here's a slightly more complicated query. Uh, here we have reviews, we're looking for reviews uh, written in July uh, for highly rated movies. Now, there might be three physical, uh, so you know I'm not gonna show the logical plan, but here's one physical plan where we do a sequential scan, we apply the filter, uh, the date filter, and then we apply the rating filter. Another one is to use the index on date to figure out all the reviews in this range of dates. And the second um, is to filter out the rows uh, that have reviews that are uh, nine or less. And finally, there's a third one, which is to use the non-clustered index. So we'll assume reviews get put in um, uh, in uh, sequential order here. So the date index, uh, sort of you see those lines don't cross at the bottom of the index. So mm -hmm. the, the date is uh, a clustered primary index, if you will, uh, and rating is a secondary non-clustered index, um, mm -hmm. indicating that every time you go through the rating index, you're probably gonna do a disk IO. Mm -hmm. So here's the third option. Now, the order, uh, so we're going to assume that the, and we're going to talk about this a little bit, the query optimizer estimates the selectivity factor of 10%, 10 percent, 0 0.10 for the index lookup um, and 0 0.01 for the rating greater than nine, because that's really a super movie. So there's going to be very <laughs> few movies with that higher rating. So here are the various selectivity factors of the various filters or predicates that this query has. Um, and the cost, if you depend on uh, some certain, make some certain assumptions, uh, the cost of the first plan optimizer estimates to be 100 seconds, the cost of the second plan, 11 seconds, and the cost of the third plan, 25 seconds. So the optimizer, after uh, uh, estimating the selectivities, and it ha well, first of all, it has to enumerate some logical plans, the logical plans will come. And here, th here are three physical plans for one logical plan. Um, and we have three, three operator trees, estimates the selectivity, and then it uses its model of the database system and the algorithms that run on that database system and the hardware, uh, which is a little bit on the abstract side to calculate an actual cost. And then it's gonna pick this middle plan. It's gonna decide uh, that looks like the best plan. So the, the, the basis of enumerating all these different plans um, is, is we, call, we call this enumerate, we, we're gonna enumerate equivalent, logically equivalent plans by applying these rules. So for, election, for example, selections and joins commute with each other. So I, if I have a, a green predicate and yellow predicate on the customer's table, it doesn't matter what order I apply them in. If I join reviews with customers, um, that's the same as joining customers with reviews. One is the outer table, table on the left is the left table, it's called, sometimes called the outer table, table on the right uh, is the green table. Those two uh, uh, ways, uh, logical plans are gonna produce exactly the same result. 
-hmm. you know, both get it and the result of the query will be as indicated by the selects. Now, joins are, in addition to being commutative, they're associative. So, for example, here I have join of customers and reviews, which then gets joined with movies. But I could also start off by joining movies with, with reviews and then join the result of that table with customers. So mm -hmm. both of those logical plans will produce the same result. And this, these equivalence rules allow the query optimizer to enumerate all these logical plans, which we'll see. Select distributes over joins. So if I have a select on customers, um, if, I have a cust if I'm joining customers with reviews and then selecting out some customers, I can also push the selection below the join. So here mm -hmm. I apply a selection to the customer um, table and only those customers that satisfy that selection predicate get joined. Obviously, that's something query optimizers always do. They always try to push selections before joins. And then I can do projection. If I have a table and I want customer ID and name um, at, for some part of the query, and then the final result only has name, I can actually push these things um, together and just project on name. So let me give you some examples of equivalent logical plans. So here's, here's my sample database, really simple customers with four columns at the bottom left, reviews with four columns at the body, bottom right, and movies with four columns. Um, and the keys are customer ID is the key of the customer table. Uh, the, the, the key of the reviews table is customer ID um, and movie ID. Um, and the key of the movies table is movie ID. Mm -hmm. So here's a query that uh, says, give me the title and directors from these three tables, movies, reviews, and customers, um, where the customer lives in New York. Uh, the rating on the movie is that the customer gave is above seven. And then we have the join. So we're looking for the titles and directors of all movies uh, by customers living in New York uh, with ratings uh, such that the rating of the movie has greater than seven. The rating the customer gave is greater than seven. Um, so here is one logical plan. So we have a couple selections, uh, city equal New York on, on customers, um, rating greater than seven on reviews. And then I'm gonna join customer ID with review ID and then join the result of that join with movies on uh, reviews.movieid equal movies.movieid and then do a projection. So here's, here's the one possible logical plan. Um, there, there are five logically equivalent plans. So if we pull selection above the join, probably not a good idea in <laughs> general, um, that gives us one. Um, we can do another selection, pull the yellow selection up above the join. That's another one. Um, we can do uh, this one, oh, uses the com commuter, commutivity rule, rule, excuse me, to flip <laughs> the yellow select and the green select. So uh, on the one on the right has yellow over green, the one on the left has green over yellow. Um, so we apply the predicates in a couple different orders, or we could start at the beginning. Um, so here, five from the original logical plan, I, I, I've quickly <laughs> enumerated um, Five, four different alternatives to that that plan, and there are four more. I can apply join commutivity, and you can you can click through these slides when you download them. Um, I can flip the order of the joins uh, and join. Um, uh, so I can from the upper from the one in the center, I can push the join uh, of movies with reviews down. Um, mm -hmm. I can do uh, push pull the selection up. Select commutivity, apply the select commutivity rule, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so in general, if you sit there and do all this PowerPoint, which I remember taking you just forever. How um, long? Yeah. Here, here are nine logical plans. So and this is really super important. So here's a query involving two joints. And I'm sure a lot of you write queries with many, many, many joint, more joints than two joints. Here's pretty simple query i found nine logical plans and, and notice this is critical to keep in mind at this point i haven't picked uh 
physical plans for any of these. <laughs> so again, for, for each of those joins, I might use nested loops, yeah. I might use hash join, I might use sort merge join, I might use index nested loops. Um, so I, I, there's just a tremendous explosion when I convert from logical to physical. But even among the logical space, there are lots of different ways that I can um, execute this query. Um, so the second phase is enumerate. So we, we've seen how we enumerate the logical plans space by applying these equivalence rules, you know, commutivity, uh, project, you know, a push distributivity, et cetera. Um, and again, I encourage you to download the slides, load up the PowerPoint. Um, all I ask about the by the PowerPoint is if you lift a bunch of slides, please attribute the slides. Um, I love people to take advantage of all that work generating that PowerPoint, but uh, please attribute that uh, where you got that. So uh, let's assume that the optimizer has three uh, common join strategies, nest, and I'll talk a little bit about those in a little bit, nest loop, sort merge, and hash join, and two ways of doing selections. Um, and I'm pretty much ignoring group by, uh, you know, uh, aggregates with group by, uh, but uh, there are a couple different ways of doing those. So I tried to make the queries as simple as possible. So here's Michelle, one of those. Uh, Michelle has a really good question. Michelle says, okay. Does the query optimizer stop here and choose the right logical plan before it keeps going to the physicals, or does it? Oh just no! Great, right great question. Right. No, uh, it, so it's going, and you'll see this in uh, an example. We'll click through in a bit. For each of those logical plans, it's going to explore a whole space of physical plans, but it's going to use something called dynamic programming, or uh, to to try to prune physical plans as quickly as possible. Um, so no, it's a great question. No, it, it, it's going to, it can't just pick one logical plan at this point. It has to do, uh, it has to expand the, the, the logical plan into a, a number of physical plans before it can do pruning. Does that help? Yes, that's perfect. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, stop me anytime. Okay. There's um, one other one. I don't know if you want to take it now or not, but Todd also asks, he says, have you, or was there any thought into offloading this to GPUs or to having a central query optimizer that you could push uh, query plan design off to? Uh, I've never, it's, that, that's a really good question. Um, uh, I, I, you know, there there has been some work uh, on the use of GPUs for executing relational operators, but as far as I know, nobody has ever uh, explored for query optimization. But that's a great research project, and I'll suggest it to some smart MIT grad students. So <laughs> thank you for that one. Uh, that. It is an interesting question. You know, GPUs are really good at applying the same. Um, uh, operator to large amounts of data. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. Okay, more questions. Should we break? More questions? There's one other one. Mark asks, has there been any research into having the query optimizer estimate the different cost of different hardware, like spindles versus flash, few versus high cores, low versus fast memory? Uh, unless, I mean, I've been gone from, Mike, from Microsoft for two or three years. When I left, the answer was no. There's some attempt by the optimizer to um, uh, do some sort of estimate about how, you know how many cores and and how fast they are, uh, but there there's there's no query optimizer that I'm aware of that actually runs a set of tests on the installed on which the install database system is installed um, to calculate exactly how fast the CPUs are and how many cores there are, how fast the I/O subsystem. Um, and, and the reason is it, it's not important to get the exact cost correctly. Okay, that's really important to understand. What's important is to get the relative cost of the alternatives uh, correctly. So, it, you know, the optimizer guessed this thing's going to take 100 seconds and this other one's going to take 300 seconds, whereas in fact they take 10 seconds and 30 seconds. All mm -hmm. that you care about is that the estimated times are in the correct relative order to uh, relative order to each other as the 
actual times are. So you, you want the estimated and, and actual to be of all the different plans to be ordered in the same sort of total order. Um, gotcha. Okay. Perfect. So here's one of these nine logical plans. Um, here's one physical plan. So I'm going to use a sequential scan and let's read through all the pages of the customer table. Um, uh, I'm going to use an index scan to pull out reviews um, that uh, are particular for a particular movie. Uh, then I'm going to do a hash join. Then I'm going to do a nested loops join uh, to join the result of the, take the result of the orange join. Uh, and so you see, I've taken and labeled these these logical operators with physical algorithms that the database system has implemented. And then I'm going to use a nested loops for my last join. There, there are, so remember there were, wait a minute, now I forget already, you guys asked me questions, I'm kind of old. Uh, there were nine logical plans. Okay, sorry, sorry for the clicks, guys. Um, there are nine logical plans, um, and there's one, here's one physical plan um, for that single logical plan. Um, with nine logical plans, there are about 324 physical plans that the optimizer must enumerate in cost. Okay, so this goes back mm -hmm. to Mich Michelle's question. We take the logical plan. For each logical plan, we're going to try to uh, all sorts of alternatives, physical plans. And then we're left with this stack of 324 physical plans that we need to cost, and, and then we'll pick the best one. And again, this is a really simple query, two joins, a couple selections, and a projection. Um, and the technique used is dynamic programming. And I'm going to try to explain how that's done. The actual algorithm is really complicated. Um, and sometimes optimizers work bottom up and top SQL Server happens to be a top down memo based optimizer. But, but the idea is um, it's OK to enumerate 324 plans for the simple query. But as we saw at the beginning, that TPCH query, which had five, six, seven tables, uh, there were 22 million um, logical plan alternatives, uh, let mm -hmm. alone physical plans. <laughs> okay, so here are the main steps. We enumerated the logical plans. For each logical plan, we enumerated the physical plans uh, by, for each relational operator, uh, looking at the alternative algorithms that can be used to implement that. And now we need to cost um, all those plans. So how do we estimate, going back to that really simple query, how do we estimate how many rows will satisfy this simple predicate, movies.movieid equal 932? Um, so the plan quality, estimating the cost of plan is really super highly dependent on the, on the quality of the estimates um, the optimizer makes. And the standard way of doing that it are, are histograms. Now, it's interesting, um, some database systems, if you look at some uh, modern uh, database, database systems like Presto or that for big data warehousing, uh, there are a lot of systems out there that still don't have histograms, uh, even though they've been around since uh, a guy named Bob Coy at, the, at Berkeley as a grad student introduced them into an early version of Ingress. There are a bunch of different ex flavors of histograms. I'm going to talk about two, equal width and equal height. So here, I, here I've uh, shown a simple little bar chart. And it, it, I'm going to take a second to explain what this bar chart looks like. So the x-axis are the customer ID values in the reviews table. So there are 20 customers. Okay, so this is really mm -hmm. simple. Okay, everybody. The, so customer one has five reviews. Customer two has 52 reviews. Customer three has 83 reviews. Over on the right, customer 19 has already made only made five reviews. In general, it's impossible to for every uh, customer in a database or every you know sort of major entity in a database that to keep track of how many how many values or how many reviews there are so so if you run this predicate uh, uh, select uh, customer you know uh, um, how many reviews did customer nine did uh, mm -hmm. how many reviews has customer nine uh, uh, 
uh, given, um, we'll look and say he, nine has done 55 reviews out of a total of 939 reviews in this table. So the selectivity factor is about 6%, 0.059. Um, so 6%. If the predicate is what it's a range predicate between two and three inclusively, uh, if you look over here on the left, uh, there are uh, customer two has done 52, customer three has done 83. So the total is 135 reviews over um, 939 total reviews, so about 15%. Um, and as I said earlier, there's generally not enough space in the catalogs to store statistics for each distinct attribute value. And, and the solution modern database systems use is called histograms. So this first kind of histogram is called an equal width. I take the key range, in this case, just one to 20, and I divide it into five buckets. Um, so I have one, one customer ID one to four in the first bucket, five to eight, nine to 12, 12 to 16, 17 to 20. Um, so the last bucket only covers four uh, customers, the rest of them cover five. So, and then I aggregate together. So if you sum up how many reviews customers one, two, three, and four have done, uh, they've done about 82 reviews. Mm -hmm. Five, six, seven, eight, about 161, et cetera. So I've taken 20 values and I've distilled it into five different values of counts. Um, and in fact, it's SQL Server, at least the last time I looked, uh, mm -hmm. No matter how many rows there are in a table, the, the histogram, the maximum size of a histogram, I, I believe, the maximum number of entries in a histogram is 255 or 256, um, something like that. So there's a pretty standard size that a histogram uses for a table, uh, for e excuse me, for each column of the table. And it's, it's kept relatively small so that uh, the, ta the, the, ske the amount of space consumed in the schema and the catalogs is not too great. So here are the actual... Uh, uh, what ends up in the histogram. Then. Yeah, what ends up, excuse me, thank you. What ends mm -hmm. up in the histogram. Um, 146, 309, I added these things wrong earlier, 186 and 206. So let's go back to the previous example from the previous slide where I had the count per customer exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw that customer nine had 55 reviews uh, out of 939, so 6%. Um, the estimated, I take the customer nine value the, in the predicate. Mm -hmm. I look up the value for the histogram for the range nine to 12, and I see that uh, there are four values in this range. That's why, so there are 186 total. There are four values that this range covers, 9, 10, 11, 12. Um, and there, so we take 186 and divide it by four because we assume uniformity within the bucket range and then divide that by 939. And so we get a pretty accurate estimate. So we've saved a lot of space in the, for the histogram and we get a pretty accurate estimate. Let's take a slightly different one. Uh, the actual selectivity factor, uh, 10 reviews over 939, so about 1%. Um, the estimate, again, I take customer five, I look in my histogram to see what range covers it. Um, the range is five to eight, there are 309 reviews, total reviews for this range, uh, and there are four values, five, six, seven, and eight. So I divide 309 by four, um, and then divide that by the to total number of views, and I get 8%. Okay, so th this use of histograms for this particular predicate, for the first predicate, it was pretty good, uh, customer ID equal nine, but customer ID equal five, it's, it's off mm -hmm. by a factor of eight. And this is the kind of thing that happens to query optimizers all the time. The statistics might not be up to date, um, the, uh, the, the histogram doesn't capture distinct values very well, uh, but this is an 8x error in the selectivity factor, which is bad. So there's another way of building histograms. Uh, this was, again, called equal width because I divided the key range into equal size buckets. Um, there's another approach, which is instead of dividing the key range equally, I divide the key range so that each bucket has approximately the same number of values. So here you see, again, my key range from 1 to 20. 
Um, I have, uh, you know, my count for the, the various history, you know, uh, reviews for each of the buckets there. Um, and then I could aggregate things together. So range, customer ID range one to five has 156 total reviews, six has 157, uh, seven to eight has 142. So to the max, to the maximum extent possible, I want to make sure that every bucket uh, in the histogram has exactly the same value. Um, and it will never happen exactly, you know, that it'll be perfect, but this is pretty close. So let's look at the errors in the, in the two. So here now we've uh, presented the two equal width and equal with equal height together. Um, example one, um, that was our problem one, customer ID equal five. Uh, we, the estimated error, the actual selectivity factor was 0 0.011. The estimated selectivity factor is 0 0.8. Um, if we take the same predicate and look at uh, the equal height histogram, um, I'm, I'm still off. I, the, that range has 156 values in it, reviews in it, um, and I estimate factor of three. So I've gotten a factor of, uh, you know, I've gotten a factor of two and a half better by switching from equal width to equal height. Um, here's another example. Um, here's the, the problem one. Um, so recall that equal height value six is a very frequent value. Okay. That mm -hmm. person, that customer has reviewed a lot of movies. Um, and if you use an equal height, equal width histogram, it estimates a selectivity factor of 0.08, um, 8% as opposed to actual 16. Um, but with a equal height histogram, um, you get uh, a perfect estimate. So this is why SQL Server, for example, uses, and all modern database systems uh, use equal height histograms. Actually, they use something uh, beyond equal height called max diff, um, and they will keep some additional values to get even better estimates. And this is work done by uh, Yanis Ioannidis at Wisconsin many, many years ago, um, and you can look up max diff histograms. Frank Gill, while you're on there, Frank Gill thinks he saw the math error. If you uh -oh. go back, if you go back to, okay, so this slide shows 993 as the denominator. And I think the one before that shows, he said shows 939. He thinks that might be it. Oh, yes. No, very good. It is. Good. Very good. <laughs> Frank Gill, you win a prize. Yeah, she won a prize. <laughs> and I'll, 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 I'll tell my wife somebody found it again. So, <laughs> Thank you, Frank, and I'll try to fix this in case I ever give this talk again. So, there thank you. Go. Okay, let's click through these. Uh, so, histograms are really, really critical, um, and errors still occur, um, uh, and, and we'll see, especially if they're correlated attributes. I'll come back to that. Um, and obviously, other statistics uh, stored by the database system. Uh, the number of, of rows, the number of pages in the table, the number of distinct values in a column, uh, the number of nulls in the column. Um, so there are a large number of other statistics that the query optimizer depends on. Um, so to estimate, think, you know, things like, is, is this attribute null in this table? So you want to be able to estimate selectivity um, from that kind of predicate. The second, next thing I want to talk about is the cost of uh, estimating uh, the, the execution cost of, of each operator in the plan. So there are two main factors that database systems worry about. How much time is spent doing disk IO uh, and how much time is spent doing CPU. Now, the interesting thing is no query that I'm aware of um, does a great job or any job of saying how much buffer, how big is your buffer pool? How big is your sort space? Okay. Um, obviously, if your buffer pool is big enough to hold your entire uh, database, your entire table, database system is at runtime is probably never going to do much I/O. Might do some I/O to bring pages in off the off the uh, mass storage device, but. Uh, it, it, this again, again goes back to the question, um, why don't database systems look at the current hardware uh, in estimating these times? And it's just, it's just not done because the goal is to get good relative performance and not exact performance or exact cost. Um, 
And this just what I said. And then in a parallel database system, uh, such as mm -hmm. SQLDW or Redshift, uh, any of the parallel Presto, any parallel database system, there's an additional cost that the optimizer will consider. And that's when you do you have a parallel database system, you sometimes have to shuffle data among the nodes of the parallel database system. Um, if you're running on uh, some versions of SQL DW, the, date, the table sits on Azure storage. Uh, other versions of SQL DW, my understanding is there now an, is an option for uh, uh, local SSD storage or flash storage. But that's a third, this is a third cost and I'm gonna ignore that since we're not talking about parallel databases today. Hmm. So here's my, here's my query. You know this really well by now. There are two physical plans. Um, which plan is cheaper? Um, so let's assume that uh, there, there are, the table reviews has 100,000 pages. There are 100 rows per page. They're sorted on date. Uh, it's stored sequentially, so I can read it at 100 megabytes a second, which is a reasonable number for a single disk drive. If it's on flash, it should be running at a terabyte or a, 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 a gigabyte or two at a second. So it's going to take about eight seconds, assuming pages are about 4K. Uh, we apply the filter to 10 million rows because that's 100,000 times 100 is hopefully 10 million. I hope I didn't get that <laughs> math wrong. Uh, the optimizer estimates that 100 rows will satisfy the predicate. Um, let's assume that it runs at a, a tenth of a microsecond per row, which is probably a little bit slow uh, for modern CPUs. Uh, we're ignoring whether it's multi-threaded or not. Uh, mm -hmm. If it's multi-threaded on a multi-core machine, um, this, these, these Predicates will be applied uh, by the different cores in parallel. And eventually we have to compute an average aggregate and we'll take those 100 rows that satisfy the predicate and mm -hmm. feed them into the average. Um, and again, that can be parallelized uh, uh, to, at the low level. Mm -hmm. So again, we'll assume something really simple. Uh, the 100 rows get processed by the aggregate at a tenth of a microsecond each. And that's going to be, um, uh, I don't know, one uh, hundred thousandth of a second, or think one ten thousand thousand, ten thousand one hundred thousandth of a second. Not very much. So the optimizer is going to say, okay, if I pick this plan, it's going to take about nine seconds. Now, plan two is to use that index. Remember that index mm -hmm. reviews is sorted on date, and and movie ID index is non-clustered. That's what those, those funny little lines at the bottom are tended. Mm -hmm. So we say 100 rows are estimated to satisfy the predicate. Um, we're going to assume that two disk IOs are done uh, for each of the 100 rows, 0.03 seconds per IO at 100 megabytes a second, about, um, again, estimating. Um, if it's flash, the seeks don't matter too much, um, like at all. Um, and so the IO time will be 0.3 seconds. Uh, the average computation, same rate to process the aggregate rows, 0.3 seconds. So clearly, plan two is always the plan to pick. Um, you know, plan one was nine seconds. Oops, nine seconds, plan two, 0.3 seconds. Oh, that's not always true. What if there's a mistake in the estimation? So what if this thing is just simply wrong, the estimate? Uh, instead of 1,000 rows, instead of 100 rows satisfying this predicate, uh, you didn't have good statistics, you never created statistics in the first place, you did a lazy DBA, um, <laughs> you, you, you would get a graph that looks something like this. So here's a, here's a graph where I've plotted on the x-axis the number of rows that satisfy the predicate. Um, the, there's, you see the 100 uh, points, so it's a log plot on the mm -hmm. x-axis. That's uh, indicated 100. It takes about 0.3 seconds. So that's the blue dot on the left. In general, the, the green line is the cost of using the index as a function of the number of rows that satisfy the predicate. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. The red line is what happens if you just sequentially scan the table. Okay, so that's all, except for a mod, modest increase in number of rows you have to process, that execution time is always a pretty constant nine or 10 seconds. So there's a crossover point 
Um, and I don't know, can I use my mouse? Oh, that's kind of interesting. You can. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's a, oh, yeah. So, you know, I've never done these before. So maybe <laughs> next time I'll do a better job, you guys. So thank you. <laughs> you so, we'll let you uh, pass. I, I, right. I'm, I'm losing people like flies. So, okay. So, <laughs> no. Guys, you'll make me feel bad. Uh, so the crossover point is the point at which it becomes cheaper to just scan it um, than it is to use the index. And again, this is why it's so important for the optimizer to be able to accurately estimate through histograms um, uh, how many rows are going to satisfy a predicate. And it's why it's so important to do update statistics and why database systems collect histograms and all the different columns uh, that make sense to. Because there, there are these cost curves that will cross over and one algorithm will become that was really good became bad. And, and frankly, this is one of my pet peeves. I hope, not, I hope none of no SQL Server Optimizer guys are listening out there. Uh, I, I found, especially SQL Server, far too often wanting to use index nested loops join when it would have been much better to do sort merge join. That doesn't happen at a join for in a simple query, but it, it, think of a, a, a query that has many different joins in it and many different selection predicates and errors propagate upwards. So maybe mm -hmm. the, the error calculation at the bottom of the physical plan is quite contained. But those errors propagate and multiply so that the input statistics for the estimates way up for a join way up high in the query tree are almost always wrong. Um, and this, again, we'll come back to this and the, why the cloud's going to change things. So here's my slightly more complicated query where I'm finding uh, movie titles and directors for customers in New York with rating greater than seven. Um, so there are three basic join methods, which we've talked about, nested loop, sort, merge, and hash join. Um, very different performance correct characteristics and critical for the optimizer to pick the right one. These things are really simple to, to think about. Uh, sort merge is um, a very classic algorithm. You sort the one table on the join attribute, you sort the other table on the join attribute, and then concurrently you scan the two tables gluing matching rows back together. This is for equijoins, uh, and almost all joins are equijoins. So this is a great algorithm, very stable, um, uh, gives the same similar performance uh, over a large range of sizes of reviews and movie tables. Um, so here's basically the algorithm. We sort it, um, we sort uh, movies, and then we merge. And there's a little loop that pulls a row from reviews, pulls a row from movies, and these cursors move downward in the two tables um, looking for matching. And it, 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 once the two tables are sorted, um, it makes one sequential pass. So the cost is sorting and this is beyond this talk, sorting can actually be done by reading and writing basically any table uh, twice. So I read it, I produce a bunch of sorted runs, I write the sorted runs, then I merge the sorted runs. So it's four times uh, uh, the number of pages in RIOs, uh, four times the number of pages in MIOs, and then a final scan. So a total cost of um, basically, if you will, five passes over the R table and five passes over the movies table. And it's not so bad. Nested loops does sort of the obvious thing. It takes um, each page of the reviews table, reads the entire movies table. Uh, so you can read through this code, pseudocode a little bit later, but basically takes a reviews page a block of the reviews table for every row in that block it basically scans the entire movies for every for the whole block it scans movies once and it's an n squared algorithm so it's one scan of r and r r, r i have to for every block in r i have to scan all of them um and index nested loops works in a similar way. I take reviews, I have a nested loops join, but instead of uh, scanning movies for every single uh, block of R or page of R, um, I just use the join attribute values out of the reviews to do an index lookup. Um, and here's the basic algorithm. Uh, the cost formula is you got to scan R for every block of R. You have to figure out how many uh, rows are on that block. So the total number of rows in the table is this uh, is is cap cap captured by this. 
So this is the number of rows and the number of tuples in that table divided by the number of uh, pages in that table. So this, ba this basically says how many rows on average are there per page? Mm -hmm. um, um, so this is the point here that if you take the total number of rows divided by the number of pages, you get the average number of rows per page. Um, and you assume that there are two disk IOs done. Um, so you go to the index and then you go to the data. And that's probably a little generous. That constant could maybe just as easily be three if the table's really big and consequently the index has three or four levels. Um, so if we assume reviews has a million tables for our simple little query, um, uh, and the selectivity factor of the date is 0.1 and the selectivity factor of the predicate on reviews is 0.01, um, the number of qualifying rows here is 100,000 and the number of qualifying rows that will satisfy this is 10,000. How many rows, output rows will the query produce? Um, turns out if they're not correlated, you mm -hmm. can just multiply selectivity factors. So if the date of the review has nothing to do with the actual review, um, we can estimate from the million ro rows that are in this table, the, pre the query is going to produce uh, 1,000 rows. But if they are correlated, if, if that particular month uh, had great movies, okay, um, it could be as high as 10, 100,000 rows. Okay, let's assume that July, this is July, it's black, blockbuster season, everyone loves the movies, um, <laughs> and so the dates are cor correlated, and we may get 100,000 rows out of the two. And why does this matter? Well, here's this query, um, and if we assume there are 10,000 pages and 80 pages a row, and movies is 2,000 pages, and the primary index, um, here's what we'll get um, for, let me just pop back, Here's what we'll get for the performance of different join algorithms. So here I've plotted the selectivity factor of this predicate, okay? Um, uh, rating great, so the rate, again, in the upper left, the rating is greater than nine, and the date is uh, for July. Um, and so I've plotted the selectivity factor. This is a log plot on both axes, log, log plot. Um, so if, and so here's the selectivity of the predicate uh, varying from, uh, that looks like 1 million, uh, 1 to, uh, 0 0.000001 to mm -hmm. 1, and the performance of the different join algorithms. So, so again, the query optimizer is given this very simple query and given this selection predicate, which looks pretty innocuous, rating greater than 9 and date uh, in this range. The join algorithm picked, uh, whether it's the right algorithm or not, will depend mm -hmm. on the selectivity of that predicate. Uh, if it's not correlated, when we said there are going to be a thousand rows out of a million, you know, we're over here on the left. But if, if they're highly correlated and we're over here on the right, here we see sort merge. You know, sort merge is pretty constant. No matter what happens, sort merge costs about the same. Um, uh, this is the orange is sort merge. The mm -hmm. block, uh, the, the brown line, uh, at least on my screen, is nested mm -hmm. loops, and the blue line is index nested loops. So if you're over in the left hand selectivity factor, if you if the optimizer guesses at the left, index nested loops is the right thing to do. If it's in the middle sort of, then nested loops is faster. Um, but there's a huge range on the right where um, sort merge um, is by far, by far. Look at that's a log scale on the <laughs> y-axis. So sort merge takes at most nine seconds, and these nested loops algorithms uh, will take order of a thousand, you know, a thousand, five thousand seconds, um, and that's a huge performance hit. And so this is the kind of thing where Estimating these complex correlated predicates is just super hard, um, and the, re the consequence can be huge. So sometimes people have talked about building multidimensional histograms, um, taking two attributes, uh, and here you see an example. Um, 
I don't, I don't know. I don't know whether SQL Server currently has them or not, but uh, uh, it is an idea that the research community has explored, uh, and this would allow you to capture correlated uh, attributes for at least two. If there are three, then you're in a three-dimensional space. Uh, so I think I'm going to skip this for sake of time. Uh, and you can look at this. You can hear hearts breaking. <laughs> oh, I doubt it. Um, so yeah, I've already talked an hour. So how big is the plan space involving end tables? So again, the steps we've talked about enumerate the logical equivalent plans. For each logical equivalent plan, enumerate all alternative physical plans. Estimate the cost of each of the alternative plans. And the question is, how big is the plan space? Um, now, it turns out the answer is uh, dependent on the shape of the physical plans. So here are two common query shapes. Um, and I call these, star, these are generally called star, star queries and chain queries. So you'll see um, the star query has a fact table at the center. And it's joined with a bunch of dimension tables, A, B, um, A, B, C, and D. So here's my big fact table. I know I haven't made these you know, to size. I apologize. Here's the mm -hmm. chain query. Um, A joins B, B joins C, C joins D, D joins F. Okay, so here are five tables. And uh, each table, uh, uh, well, B, C, and D get joined with two other tables. A, gets, A and F just get joined with one other table. Um, so... If there are five tables, as I've shown with this example, um, there are 384 logically equivalent plans for the star query um, and 224 for the chain query, okay? Um, but if you look down this chart, if there are eight, six tables involved and star has 38, 40 uh, possibilities of uh, logically equivalent physical plans, if we get down here to 10, we're, uh, we've got a lot of plants, okay, uh, 18 million plants. Um, and in fact, typical queries fall uh, between these two alternatives. Um, now, how can you say that, how could there be, let's go back to this example, how could there be five logically equivalent uh, plans for, for this thing here? Well, I could start with the join, think about this, I could start with the join of A and F, or I could start with, uh, and then take that and join it with D, uh, and then take the result of that and join it with C, and then take that and um, join it with B. Or I could start with this pair, and then do this pair, and then do this pair, and then do this pair. Or I could start with this pair, and then do this pair, and then do this pair, and then do this pair. <laughs> so this is how, if you actually run the math, Th these, I think, are the right numbers, unless there's another math error. So um, <laughs> we'll move on before somebody discovers, no, no, no that's not quite right. Turns out, so, so the, is again, the shape of the query uh, typically is sort of between these two alternatives. And lots of times star joins are very, you know, very popular. Um, uh, another thing that's done is is to not do bushy plans. So here's what I call a bushy plan. So notice that um, I have a join of A and B and I take the result of that and I join it with the result of first joining D and E and then taking the result of that yellow join and feeding it into the green join, which is feeding into the uh, turquoise join. Generally database systems to again reduce the plan space because you gotta cost all these alternatives generally just consider right deep query plans. So, excuse me, left deep query plans. Um, uh, so I join A with B, I join that with C, I join that with D, I join that with E. Um, so this is has a big, big uh, impact on how many logical alternatives there are. Remember, I've enumerated physical alternatives. So here's a little graph or chart, uh, star drawing queries on the left, uh, chain join queries on the right, the number of tables involved. Um, and you look and see uh, mm -hmm. for each type, general type of query shape, star versus chain, um, star uh, bushy, star left deep, huge reductions by going left, 
considering only lefty plans. So that's another compromise database query optimizers make because there could very well be the best plan could be one of those bushy plans that gets ignored if the optimizer only does left deep. But you, you, the, going back to the beginning, the goal of the query optimizer is to get a pretty good plan in a short period of time. Um, you can't afford to spend weeks or months optimizing an eight-way join query. Okay, It's got to be optimized in a few seconds. So again, these are logical plans only um, with three join methods and end joins in a query. The, the actual math looks something like this. Um, mm. uh, three to the n uh, physical plans for each logical plan. Um, and, and this again, this formula calculation ignored the selections because mm -hmm. there might be three alternatives for each selection. Um, so the, the, the number of physical alternatives again, really blows up quickly. Uh, and, you know, here's the last little bit for left deep, eight, eight table star join query, uh, uh, 10,000 different logical plans and 22 million different physical plans um, with three join methods. Um, so the solution to this problem is something we call dynamic programming. And um, it's either done bottom up or top down. And, and the idea is of one, avoid um, enumerating the space completely. Um, and number two, prune aggressively, um, and we'll talk about that. But they are heuristics, and they sometimes cause the best plan to be missed. So the idea is to perform the optimization in n passes where n tables are joined. Um, pass one finds the best lowest cost one relation plan. Uh, and pass two says, you know, here, here's the best way of doing these selections. Let me illustrate with this example. Um, what's the best way of joining this single relation plan to another relation? And then I take the two relation plans and I join in the third table. And I take a third, the, you know, the best of the three relation plans and join in the fourth. So this is uh, uh, takes n passes, one per table, um, and the optimizer will aggressively prove uh, both lowest cost and interesting order. And let me so let me give you an example. Uh, and then finally, order by, group by, aggregates, those are all pretty much done at the final step. Um, still exponential in the number of tables. So here's a simple example of uh, four tables, A, B, C, D, uh, some selections on uh, uh, every table but the yellow table, B, so you can think of that maybe um, as a fact table. So what does it mean to generate all single relation plans? Um, so first I start with A and I say, okay, I can do sequential scan or index scan. For B, I can do sequential scan. For C, I can do sequential scan or index scan. And for D, I can do sequential scan or in index scan. So those are single relation plans. Those are physical plans, mm -hmm. which are alternatives that I need to estimate selectivities and cost. Well, all of them are gonna have the same selectivity, but they'll have different costs. So that's my single plans. Now, here are the estimated uh, costs associated with those. And notice, I'm gonna prune out, you know, if you look at these C plans, this plan on the left costs 38, the plan on the right costs 18. And so I'm gonna get rid of it. And the same over here, uh, this index scan on D takes 95 seconds or has cost of 95. The, doing a sequential scan, that only costs 42. So I'm going to I'm going to keep two plans here, but for every other table, I end up with one single relation plan. Now I have to take each of these tables A, B, C, and D um, after I've pruned in their cost and and join them according to the shape of the query, which I've shown in the upper right. So A, A can join with B. Um, B can join with A, but B can also join with C or D uh, next. C can only join with B, and D can only join with B. So I, I, I have start adding, okay, here's A joining with B, um, and I could do it uh, making A the outer and B the inner, okay? This is both sequential scan. Um, A the outer, uh, B the inner using sort merge instead of nested loops. 
here's my other single relation plan for A, index scan of A as the outer, sequential scan of B as the inner, using next nested loops, and same thing using cert merge. This, so I, in this particular example, I've tried to make sim things simpler by throwing out hash join, which is generally the best join method. So I estimate the cost, I estimate the selectivity factor of the predicates, I estimate the cost, um, and I'm gonna get rid of everything but the plan on the right. So that's starting with A. Now I have to do the same thing starting with B. Uh, B can join with A, B can join with C, B can join with D. Here's the only single relation plan for B. Um, so it's, uh, I take and um, if I could have joined B with A, I can do it with nested loops, I can do a sort merge, I can do it with nested loops, sort merge, either of the two A plans. B join D, um, this, this particular join um, is gonna use this plan for D um, and there's nested loops and sort merge and nested loops and sort merge for B join the other alternative, uh, which is with C. I cost them, I prune them, and I throw out all the plans that get pruned. Now I have to do the same thing with C. C can join with B, that's the only alternative. Um, I can do sort merge and nested loops, I cost them, I prune. There it looked, nested loops are really bad. And finally, I can start with D. Um, I can only join D with B, but I can use two different algorithms uh, as shown here and cost them and prune them. So that's how the optimizer works. It starts with a single relation. What's the best way of getting access to each single relation? What's the best taking, after I prune those and, and reduce the subset uh, plans, what's the best way of joining those plans with another table? And I'm gonna keep expanding this. <laughs> Uh, further prune the two relation plans because these things are equivalent. Uh, doesn't matter on sort bridge join, which is the outer and inner. So if you look at these, they're all the same. Um, and then I have to plans to start with two. Well, who can I join A and B with? Well, I can join A and B. If you look up here, I can join A and B with C. Or I can join A and B. Once I've joined A and B, I can join that, joined A and B here. I can join that with D. Um, and I can do it, you know, with set, each one with sort merge is, is in this example down here, or I can join A and B with C with one with sort merge, one with nested loops, um, or all sort merge with D. So if you look at this, I keep going, I keep expanding one relation at a time. Um, and, and, you know, I can start with B and this goes on and on and you know I, I, I keep expanding the, the, the left deep plan by adding an additional operator corresponding to an additional join and then for all the different join methods I, I produce a physical plan and I cost it and I prune and this just continues etc and you can click through this. Daryl Daryl says Lord help the optimizer. <laughs> yes and again you know the optimizer is doing this very very quickly and you know, it's interesting, you know, as memories have gotten bigger, um, it's possible to keep more plans around, but you're absolutely right. There are, uh, it's a, and it's, it's, you know, the ideal thing for a computer to do because it's pretty easy to write code that um, expands these spaces um, and, you know, go from one relation, two relations, to three relations, to four relations. Um, mm -hmm. um, again, the hard part is costing. Mark asked a question too. He says, when you said cons the optimizer only considers left deep query plans, is this as opposed to bushy ones? He says, is this also true for most relational database vendors or just SQL Server? Uh, I think it's true for most. Uh, simply, uh, you know, it's, 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 there are actually cases where there's another plan space called right deep, um, uh, which sometimes has its advantage in a, when things are highly pipelined. Um, uh, I think it's true in general, and it may not even be true for SQL anymore, but it's, there are so many plans just with left deep, um, the space just explodes with Bushy. Um, so I think, you know, again, you know, I'm, I'm just not, this is something I'm not up to date on, on what everybody has, but um, my, my sense is that people just use left deep. Um, so plans frequently can be bad, uh, statistics can be missing or out of date. This is why you should always keep your statistics up to date. 
Uh, cardinalities uh, estimates assume uniformly distributed values. Even within that histogram, if you think about those equal height histograms, um, you know they have they have ranges of attribute values associated with them. There can be skew with inside the bucket, and you can still get bad estimates, at, let alone if they're correlated. Uh, such as, you know, if make is Honda, it's likely to be in accord. Um, and finally, cost estimates do not depend on the machine in which the query will be run. Uh, um, and when you upgrade the hardware, you upgrade the software, um, uh, regressions can happen. So here's some uh, ideas for uh, opportunities to improve. Uh, develop tools that give us better understanding of what goes wrong, improve the stability and use feedback. So there's, at the beginning of this talk, I, sh I showed this picture. Uh, this, this actually picture came from a professor at IIT Bangalore, Bangalore uh, Jayant Haritza. Um, and had this project called Picasso. And you can Google or Bing Picasso Haritza to mm -hmm. find the project's website. Uh, it's, the tool, last time I looked, is available for these particular database systems. And it's a simple but powerful idea. So it says, it takes a query, and here's a real simple query, a join of two tables A and B with predicates on A uh, and predicates on B. So A dot C less than some const, less than or equal to some constant, and B. And so this, what this tool does is it takes a query and allows you to say, I want to vary this particular constant value across this range. Okay, so I can vary and and, and then it will feed the query to the query optimizer and get back a plan using the show plan or explain plan mechanism. And then it will um, repeat, change the constant slightly, change constant one slightly, change constant one some more, change constant two. And it will explore the entire space, this entire range um, of A dot C and uh, less than equal to the constant and B dot D less than the constant. Um, and as I said, it, it goes to the query optimizer, it gets the plan, doesn't actually run it and for each combination. And then it plots the results. Um, and, and here's a TPCH query. So here's the, uh, the, the plot that's in Jayant's paper. So it's SQL Server uh, 2008 R2, so it's quite old. Um, on the x-axis of this plot, we have uh, the supplier account value uh, count balance, which ranges from zero to 100, um, 300 different data points. On, on the y-axis, it varies line item from zero to 100, uh, three different, 300 different data points. There are a total of 90,000 queries. There are 204 <laughs> distinct plans, and every plan is given a di distinct color um, by this uh, software tool that they built. Now, somehow, this seems a little bit overkill. Um, and if you zoom into this region at the bottom left-hand corner, <laughs> it's insane. You know, fights very small, you know, a change in color means a change in plan. So look down here, you know, here we have in this space in here, even though there are only minute changes in the count balance, there are a whole bunch of different plans in this space. Likewise here, plan one, plan two, plan three, plan four, Plan six, you look over here on the left and the colors are squeezed way in. They must have studied the four color problem to figure out how to plot this thing. So, <laughs> now, it's the key takeaway is the optimizer should not be so sensitive to the constants. Um, and it, it would have been interesting, and I don't think they ever did it uh, uh, to figure out how many of those, well, I shouldn't say they did it to some extent. Um, intuitively, this seems really bad. So let's go back to this join algorithm performance. Um, so remember, uh, nested loops and uh, index nested loops are much faster at the left end of selectivity factors. Cert merge is much more stable across the whole range of selectivity predicates. So the idea is don't use algorithms that are very sensitive to selectivities. Fewer plans means more robust plans. So this is another uh, graph from their plot. So they took this plan space and they reduced it uh, from 204 to 30 plans, okay? 
Um, and picking by picking plans that were slightly more robust. Um, so 10% max difference in terms of performance and 2% average. And they found um, that, you know, overall some plans ran slower, but it, most it was only 2%. And the results were much less sensitive. You see far fewer colors, even down in this range. Um, and, you know, it's a much, each plan covers a much broader space. So again, if the optimizer makes a mistake in this range in here, it's going to pick the same plan. So, you know, if really the selectivity is right here where my cursor is, that's what the estimate is, but the actual is over here, it's going to be okay. So errors that occur in this estimate of, you know, how many predicates, uh, how many rows are going to satisfy this predicate, um, you know, from, you know, like 10 to 40 for here in this range, this, they're all going to produce the same plan. So errors are not as significant. The second thing, and this is one thing I really regret from leaving Microsoft when I did, because this is something that was on my to-do stack. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, and it's like, oh, it bugs me. I tried to actually get it done at Facebook. I haven't had luck at Facebook to get this done. So it, the idea is really simple. Take this query plan. So here's my physical plan and insert some little simple operators. And all these operators do is they take as input what the optimizer thought the statistics look like. How many rows are supposed to come out of here? And what's the distribution of attribute values? So that's what these little histograms are to do. So the query optimizer annotates the physical plan with these little tiny statistics collections. And it also inserts an operator in here. And what this operator does is it says, Holy mackerel, this thing, you know, the optimizer thought this selection was going to produce 10 rows and it's producing thousands and thousands of rows or it produced thousands and thousands of rows. Um, there are a bunch of different things you could do with this. Um, so this is the, they collect the actual statistics and compare actual versus predicted. And here's uh, where the cloud comes in. So query optimization in the cloud, and this is this is something that I think is going to be a real game changer for query optimization. Uh, when SQL, when Microsoft or Oracle or uh, MySQL developers, uh, when someone takes the product and installs it, but it becomes sort of you know a lost child. Um, uh, the database vendor has no clue. Uh, mm -hmm. what that, that database system is doing. It doesn't know how big the tables are. It doesn't know about the hardware. It, it really has no insight to how the product is used and how it's performing, more importantly. Um, is the optimizer doing a good job of plans? Is the optimizer doing a bad job of plan plans? The world has totally changed in the cloud. And, and no vendor's done this yet, but this is going to be... Um, uh, somebody's going to do this and it's going to be a huge winner. So the, the, the vendor, well, if you think about SQL Azure, okay, um, it knows about all your tables, okay? It knows how many tables there are, how many columns each table has, what indices you've built, um, how big each table is, um, how many nulls there are. It has, you know, all the statistics um, that if you've run update statistics, it also knows exactly what hardware is being used. Yeah, you're running on the Midwest region of Azure. Um, you know, the database vendor knows what SKU those processors are, how much memory is there, how many threads there are. It knows every single query you run. Um, not even just, you know, on-prem, you know, it might be some stored procedure, ad hoc queries, stored procedures. Um, every single query run um, is... Uh, understood by the vendor, okay? Uh, I know at Microsoft, we were being very careful never to look at, at actual, the the uh, the constants in the predicates, mm. but the shape of the query plans was fair game. Um, and more importantly, the for every single query run, the vendor knows the optimized plan, it knows the original plan, knows the optimized plan, it knows the optimized plan's estimated cost, the actual running cost and the actual selectivity of each operator. Now, this is something, and so, so let's go back to that example with those check operators. I, I know the SQL, I know the logical plan, I know the physical plan the optimizer picked. In fact, I might, I might have the optimizer 
not, not pick just the top physical plan, but maybe it'll pick the top 10 physical plans. Mm -hmm. And first time through, it runs the physical, that, uh, that query. If it sees the query again, it might run a slightly different physical plan. There are all sorts of really neat things you can do in the cloud. Or it might use another set of machines to uh, run it. So the idea is to use this information to build an optimizer that works. And some people are not talking about doing this using machine learning. I think that's a little bit overkill, but um, it's an idea that some academics are pursuing. So here I have a picture of my cloud. I have a picture of my database system. I insert the check operators. Um, the executor starts running. Um, uh, and the check operator uh, uh, produces at runtime the observed stats. How selective was this predicate? How many rows came through? Um, you know, so whatever statistics the optimizer used at optimization time, the check operator will, whatever those key statistics were, the check operator will collect those at runtime and feed them back into the optimizer statistics. So this is observed stats. But we can also do cost, okay? Oh. Uh, the optimizer thought this operator, or this join, or this selection in this case, um, ought to cost x. But in fact, it costs 10x or 100x. Um, now, maybe that's a bug, so it might be able to use to find bugs. But it maybe it's just, on this particular hardware, uh, this operator is expensive. Or for mm -hmm. table B is not, um, is somehow strange, um, and the predicates are very expensive. Maybe they're user-defined functions. Um, and so we can use the observed cost. Uh, we can have the check operator collect the observed cost and feed those back into the optimizer. Now, the next time the query gets executed, we'll have updated the statistics with both observed stats and um, observed cost, and we'll do a better job of executing. And this feedback loop can go on. You know, queries get run thousands of times. The statistics keep getting better. The observed, the estimated cost keep getting better, and the query. The plan, the query optimizer will pick better plans. So mm -hmm. I, th I think this is like, as I said, this was the thing that I started to work on before I left Microsoft and moved to Boston. Um, it breaks my heart. It hasn't gotten done yet, and somebody should do it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, okay, now I'm at the end, uh, and I've talked far too long. Um, no. So, so here are the key points. Um, this is query optimizers really are hard. And you know, I can explain um, you know, the basic algorithms used to do, you know, selections and joins and aggregates and group buys and sorting and even replication. Um, those are pretty straightforward to, to explain. And yes, you have to the programming can be hard, um, but uh, it, it's, it's very hard to get query optimization right because of um, all these errors that can creep into the process. Three key phases, um, we take a piece of SQL, we convert it to a logical plan. We use these, it, these uh, rules like commutivity and distributivity to enumerate the logical plan to get a large number of logical plans. We take each logical plan and for each operator in the logical plan, we consider each of the alternative algorithms to implement that operator. Select, you know, sequential scan, index scan, nested loops join, sort merge join. Um, and for each of those physical plans, we have to estimate the selectivities of the predicates, whether they be selection predicates or join predicates or how many groups the aggregate's gonna produce. And then we have to cost. Um, so those are the three key phases. And query optimizers, teams, and I saw this all the time at Microsoft, it, they always were afraid of what it was going to do. Um, and again, so it's in the cloud, if they make a change to the query optimizer, they can quickly discover um, oh no, especially if they're check operators, you know, the, the history of this particular query used to take five seconds or 10 seconds, and now it's taking 10 minutes. There's a problem with the optimizer. Let's roll back that latest change. Um, so I, I, really, I really do really strongly believe that the move to the cloud um, is going to really, uh, really change the quality of the plans that database vendors can do. Okay, that's it. 
Um, let's. We have time for a few more questions, Brent. And people Wonderful. still. Some people still here. Yes, they are. And you know what's funny? We had Big several people it. say after you'd said <clears throat> the people were left. Several people messaged in and said, "I'm getting ready to leave shortly, but only because I have a meeting." Tell him. Yeah, she's I really know. Smart. I understand. I, I totally understand. <laughs> you know, professors always run over, right? And you know, yes, a, that's what you're walk out the door. So. <laughs> Alvaro. Dr. DeWitt, I hope you don't mind, but I took a few webcam selfies of you and me. Oh, no. Each other, so. How do you do that? <laughs> well, just took a screenshot. It looks like you and me oh, kind okay, of. Okay, okay, okay. No. Uh, and, and, uh, oh. Yes, and it's not doctor, please. It's just David. So oh. as I made this joke in the past, uh, at, at pass, I have a daughter who's a doctor, and she resents it when I, who's a real doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, he won't let so, you near a knife. I no, think. no, no, definitely not. So, okay, other qu people have questions before they. Yeah. Read this? Yeah. Alvaro asks an interesting question. He says, "Does Microsoft take research that was done by other companies, like look at Oracle's white papers or IBM's, and then use them to improve other their SQL Server?" Everybody steals from everybody else. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, it. It. What's interesting is. Um, the, the thing I find really just, you know, it's really, it's interesting being back um, in academia and I'm really sort of not really totally back in academia, but I do hang around the grad students and that do database work at MIT. It's really what's sad is I think industry is ahead of academia when it comes to database research at this point. I think, you know, wow. um, and I think it's an artifact of, you know, products um, like SQL Server have, you know, uh, gone through many iterations. Um, you know, there are a lot of smart developers at Microsoft working on the product. And I think, you know, lots of times the academics um, aren't, aren't as aware of the products uh, and what they're capable of all. Uh, of doing mm -hmm. as are the competitors. The competitors certainly look at everybody's good idea and steals everybody's good idea. Um, and um, but academics are, are it's interesting now. They're I think they're they're behind and there there are I shouldn't say that totally, but um, mm -hmm. it's it's been interesting after eight years at Microsoft to go back to academia and see what the grad students are working on. Um, and um, uh, it's sometimes not encouraging. Sometimes it's really good, and, uh, but sometimes it's like, oh, you know, SQL Server does, you know, uh, replication, you know, just good enough. Or uh, every academic seems to be building another version of Hecaton. Um, and you know, one of the things I I did manage when it for a while at Hecaton well, was what's it called now? What's the product called? In memory OLTP. Uh, in memory OLTP. You know, uh, I think the adoption of of that feature. Uh, was not as fast as people expected because of the language surface. But the grant, and I think it's also the case, hardware has gotten so fast, most customers are satisfied with plain old standard tables and flash drives. And the grad students are all off building faster and faster main memory OLTP databases. And I just scroll my head, or shake my head and say, nah, it's really a bad thing to work on. And they don't like to hear that. Their advisors don't like to hear that. Anyway. So yes, the answer is the answer. Long-winded answer to that question is yes. Uh, vendors and you know their conferences, uh, their academic conferences. There are a number of academic conferences where key people from industry, the developers from Microsoft and IBM and Oracle and MySQL, Facebook and Google. They all mingle and they all listen to each other's industrial papers. Um, so conferences like Sigma and BLDB generally have sessions by the vendors themselves. Um, uh, you know, not dissimilar to what goes on at Pass, uh, talking about features, and that's a chance for the vendors to hear what everyone's doing and pick the best ideas. Speaking of which, JH asks, he says, if you were going to go deeper into people who are data professionals today, either database developers or database administrators, and they wanted to go learn more, where would you recommend that they go next? Uh, so that, that's a, you know, um, well, I think, you know, there, 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 are, a couple, there are a couple answers. Um, the, the, probably the place I'd recommend starting is... There's, you know, if if you haven't taken a graduate or undergraduate level database class, there's some really good textbooks. There's a textbook written by Microsoft, somebody who's now Microsoft Raghu Ramakrishnan, who works for um, the part of the SQL group. 
Uh, so if if you look at any of the major database textbooks, so it's one of them is written by Ramakrishnan and, um, and Johannes Gerke, who actually I think now runs Skype. Um, there's another one by Jennifer Widom and the Stanford professors. So I think one place, to, uh, an easy place to go is to buy one of those two textbooks. Um, and maybe there's a third one, but I think the best ones, Regu's book is sometimes called the cow book because it has pictures from Wisconsin, it has <laughs> of cows on the front of it. Uh, but I think either of the textbooks of Widom and Hector Garcia Molina or Regu and Johannes, uh, and there may be a third author, I think, those are great places to start to learn more of the fundamentals. Um, and you don't need to buy the latest version. Um, you know, save money, find a used copy, um, because uh, they don't change all that much. And sometimes I think the earlier editions were actually better. Um, and the other place to figure out what's going on in the literature and what what's the state of the art is um, to, um, to uh, look at the SIGMOD and VLD proceedings. And um, maybe Brent and I can follow up and, and I could put together uh, I, at, at the end of that slide deck or maybe uh, in, in another way, uh, I could post uh, uh, some actual uh, book names and Amazon links um, uh, and uh, links to the major technical conferences in the field. But I'd Perfect. start by reading the textbooks because I think that's you know a good place to capture a broad bunch, a, a lot of information. Um, and sometimes the authors don't know what they're talking about, so don't you know <laughs> always take it with a grain of salt. So same thing with bloggers. Yes, <laughs> yes absolutely. <laughs> So there are a couple of questions. Uh, there's one from Kenny uh, about calculating statistics and uh, if linear regressions are used and if not, could they be? Uh, oh, I don't know the answer to that question. And the answer is, the answer is yes. So I don't know. Uh, I don't think, I, right. I think, uh, I think, uh, you know, within the histogram ranges, pretty much people assume uniformity. Um, and that can be a source of errors. Um, but again, I, I, you know, this is an area where I'm just not an expert uh, in, histo in histograms and what has been done. There's been a lot of academic work on histo histograms and estimating selectivities. Um, and I'm just not aware of what's made it into the products and, and what hasn't made it into the products yet. Cool. Uh, there was another one from Aaron, and it was, uh, what can we do to help Microsoft's query optimizer team improve the product? Would moving to the cloud help them at all? Uh, yes, that will help. Be gentle <laughs> when they when there's a regression. <laughs> Don't have the the president of your company call, uh, you know, sat you up and mm. scream. Okay. Uh, that's that's a, that's that's really the problem. I mean, and I, you know. Um, you know, it's uh, there's a lot of attrition in the query optimizer team at, at Microsoft. A lot of people went to Google, but a lot of it was because they become so fragile um, that every the developers were just afraid to change them and to cause a problem. So I'm really serious. Um, moving to cloud will help. Uh, uh, it, you know, uh, and again, I just don't know what Microsoft is doing currently in this space, but uh, mm -hmm. being more gentle when there's a regression and um, uh, sharing statistics, you know, sort of general statistics when that's possible, that's that's good too. So. There's an interesting question in the Slack channel. Brian says, ballpark, how many people at Microsoft maintain the query optimizer? Oh, it, 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 it let, again, when I left two years ago, uh, it was a handful, half dozen. Uh, so nice. not very many. Wow. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, again, um, there's not much development going on. Um, it's mostly a pretty stable feature at this point. Um, mm. uh, but yeah, small number. Wow, smart people. Well, thank you so much, sir, for taking okay. the time out of your day to speak to everybody. And, and, I really appreciate it. And I want to thank everyone who A, listened, and B, made a donation. You know, I think when Brent asked me to do this, uh, it was an instantaneous response, yes. Um, and I think, you know, um, this kind of, this kind of 
donation can really make a difference. So thank you. Absolutely. And folks, if you want to go either get the slides or make a donation to the Robert Davis Memorial Fund, you can go to brentozar.com slash go slash DeWitt. We will send you a reminder there too after the webcast. Webcast will be available on YouTube within about a day and the slides are available now. So thanks okay. a lot, everybody. And, I, and I'll put together this list of uh, references. Resources. Oh, cool. Well, thank you, sir. Have a great day, everybody. Okay. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Thanks.